Do these questions ever wake you up in the middle of the night? How am I going to pay for the high cost of long-term care? What would happen to my minor children if something happened to me? If I wasn't able to make decisions for myself, do my loved ones know what my wishes are regarding health care? Should I have a last will and testament or a living trust? You're listening to Bulletproof Estate Planning with Estate Plan Stan, where we address these questions and many more. Estate planning is not just for wealthy people. I've made it my mission to tell everyone who will listen that estate planning is for everyone. Don't wait until it's too late. Your family will thank you. Hey, good day to you. Good day to you. I am Stan Prochowski, and this is Bulletproof Estate Planning. This is the show where we talk about everything that has to do with estate planning and elder law. I am Estate Plan Stan. Hey, it's uh, raining. Uh, hope the power stays on. We've had some storms uh, here, so hopefully that'd be okay. Um, hey, listen, I want to start out by saying uh, over last night, uh, Friday night, no, yeah, Friday night and Saturday night, I went to uh, the Star Theater here in Pulaski and went to the, the Gatsby uh, murder mystery. It was pretty cool. Uh, we had a dinner. Uh, all the participants got to play a part in this murder of these mobsters that were all meeting in Chicago. And it was kind of cool. We had to walk around and give each other clues and uh, uh, reveal certain things. And they had to solve the mystery at the end. So uh, I was not the one who did it. So thank goodness for that. But uh, there was a murder. Sorry. But anyway, that was fun. That was fun. So Anyway, listen, I want to start off by reminding everyone, I've got a couple of uh, my speaking seminars, my free educational seminars coming up. One is just Tuesday, which I guess is the day after tomorrow, June the 8th. So Tuesday, that's going to be in Columbia uh, at the Memorial Building. I do that twice. I do that one, once at 1 p.m., do it again at 6 p.m. Now, I understand from my assistants, the 1 p.m. is pretty full, just about got a few extra spots, but the 6 p.m. has got some spots. So if you're interested, call me at uh, 931-363-7222. Talk to Tammy, Courtney, or Alex, and um, get on the RSVP list for that. The other one I'm doing is June the 19th. Now, that's a little unusual because that's a Saturday. But by popular demand, um, I've been asked, you know, we can't get out during the week. Can you please do one on a weekend? So Saturday at the Star Theater on the Square in Pulaski, I'm going to do uh, my uh, educational seminar, which is entitled Wills, Trust, and the Nursing Home at 10 a.m. at the Star Theater on June 19th. So uh, Tuesday, June the 8th, 1 o'clock and 6 o'clock in Columbia. Uh, Saturday, June the 19th at the Star Theater at 10 a.m. For those of you who can't make it out during the week. So, all right, what are we going to do today? Just a little bit different. I've been on the air for four weeks now, and I have been doing a lot of talking because this show is about education. So we talked about a lot of things. And what I'm going to do is try to kind of wrap up this basic theme I've been on um, today. And I want to open up a good half of the show maybe for questions because uh, I haven't you know, really given folks much of an opportunity to call in. Uh, before, but today I'm going to do that. So anyway, uh, I'm going to review real quickly. Uh, you know, in the first show, uh, four weeks ago, we talked about what a will, last will and testament is. And we talked about how it, how it's affected by the probate process. Then in the second week, we talked about the revocable living trust, which is an alternative to the probate process, or actually what we call a 100% probate avoidance tool. We talked about that and how that fixes all the problems with probate probate taking a long time, trust plan is, is administered rapidly. Probate being expensive, the trust, not so much. Uh, probate being 100% public, a uh, trust 100% private. And the uh, distribution at the end in probate is outright, meaning no terms and conditions, no strings attached. And with a trust, you can, as long as it's not an illegal purpose, you can put any terms and conditions or tie any strings to the inheritance that you want to do. So all the problems of probate are solved by a revocable living trust. Then uh, two weeks ago, we went into uh, the natural progression into long-term care. Uh, Cause I told you that the most popular question I get is how do I keep the nursing home from getting all my stuff in one form or another? And so, you know, we embraced that. We started talking about the risks and what puts you in long-term care. We talked about the cost being like, Seventy five hundred to eight thousand dollars a month. I mean, uh, it's catastrophic. Uh, we talked about <clears throat> why people would plan for long term care. Then last week, I talked about the solution to long term planning in what we call pre planning. Pre planning means you're not in the nursing home, you're not really headed there anytime soon. You know, you're you're basically healthy. And how we could put our property into an income only asset protection trust, which is an irrevocable trust little different than a revocable trust, 
We talked about how the Income Only Asset Protection Trust actually gives us creditor protection, where the Revocable Living Trust was a great tool for probate avoidance, but because we had complete control over the assets, we did not have, we did not have creditor protection. But the Income Only Asset Protection Trust, the Irrevocable Trust, gives us that creditor protection. And of course, the creditor everyone's worried about is Medicaid, the nursing home, or TenCare in, in Tennessee. And um, you know, that's the creditor, you know, that's the biggest creditor of all when the day comes. So, so that's the review. So, but I finished it off when I was talking most of last week, we talked about what we call pre-planning. And I just said, you know, that's when you're not in the nursing home and not headed there soon. Well, I did mention that the other kind of Medicaid planning that we do is called crisis planning. Now, and that's what I'm going to talk about tonight. So um, crisis planning, if you remember, I defined as, you know, you're already in the nursing home. That's when you come to me and say, Stan, my wife had to go to the nursing home. What can I do? How do I protect our stuff? Um, so that's crisis planning. I'm going to talk a little bit about that. Now, the first question that kind of comes to people's mind on crisis planning, meaning somebody's already in the nursing home. Is it too late for planning? Okay. I mean, is it, did, did we wait too long? Because you know, I, I, you hear me say all the time, the word planning implies doing something ahead of time, right? Uh, but, you know, if, if that happens, it's too late. Well, the answer to that is no. I mean, no way. I mean, there's a ton we can do, and there's a ton we can save. I'm going to hit on some of those tonight. And uh, what I want to do is, again, is open it up for questions. So if you want to call in any time during the show, uh, go ahead, and I'll take the question. Let me tell about, let me talk about, when we talk about crisis planning, here's how things normally go. Okay. Uh, somebody goes in a nursing home. They want to, they need to apply for 10 care and get the benefits. So we, we they list up all their total assets, everything that they own. And we can exempt the house. Uh, I talked about that last week. You can take the value of the house and take it out of the countable assets and put it in the exempt column. And they won't use that against you for eligibility, but then you're going to still end up with too many excess assets. So then what typically happens is the people say, well, you know, I was at the hairdresser and they told me we need to spend those assets down. Or my neighbor said, when you have too much, you got to spend it. So they spend it down. Um, then they spend it down and to the point where they spend it all. And now they qualify for 10 care. Now 10 care pays their bill. And now after their death, 10 care comes around with what we call the 10 care estate recovery act. And they had their hand out and want to get reimbursed for the cost of care. And, uh, you know, that's, you know, remember, you still have the house. It was just in the exempt column. So they come around and that's how they take the house through their estate recovery. So, I mean, there's nothing left. I mean, you spend it all getting yourself to qualify, you know, then they come and take whatever is left. And that is what's in the exempt column. Okay. And there's some other, a few other things that can be in the exempt column, but that's typically, that's kind of the way it works, but that's also kind of the way we don't want to do it. Okay. That's, there's no planning involved in that. And it doesn't have to be that way. So believe it or not, what your neighbor tells you or your hairdresser tells you is not exactly the best advice. So let's talk about crisis planning. Now we really can't use the income only asset protection trust for crisis planning, because remember the income only asset protection trust involves a transfer of the trust that's subject to the penalty period. And we're already in the nursing home, right? So we're trying to apply now. So the, in the in income only asset protection trust won't work. That's something where we can have five years built in before we have to uh, go in. So, so instead of spending everything down on nursing home care, which is usually what it's spent down on because you're already in the nursing home, instead of doing that, wouldn't it be desirable to maintain significant assets so that we, you know, the person in the nursing home could live a better quality of life and, uh, and, and also so that the healthy spouse is still living at home has a better quality of life. I mean, what you don't want to have happen is you don't want a, a spouse to go into the nursing home. You have a healthy spouse that's still at home and this black hole of uh, money funds get sucked out of the estate or out of the, you know, out of the home and leave the, you know, to pay all this cost of care and leave the healthy spouse at home impoverished. So that's not what, you know, that's, that's what we don't want to do. So now when we talk about long-term care, I mean, let's face it, nobody wants to go into long-term care, right? I mean, I don't want to go there. Uh, my goal is to pass away quietly in the night, in my sleep, you know, no pain. I mean, but that's not the way it usually works, right? I mean, statistically, after age 65, there's a better than not chance that we'll go in the long-term chair. It's actually, 
long-term care. It's actually up to 70%. So statistically, we're going to, we're going to end up there. So, you know, it behooves us to plan for it. So if, but if that happens, what we we want to have our assets so that we can have some money to enhance our quality of life. We don't want to spend it down, not have any, then be in long-term care and not have anything to spend. Because, you know, if that happens, you get what's called a personal needs allowance. And God bless them, that's 50 bucks a month you get to keep out of your income, okay? 50 bucks. They say, you know, so if you need to buy some razor blades or get a haircut. Now, I don't quite get the logic, but, um, you know, uh, in most every state's got, got a pers- uh, personal needs allowance, but it's not much. Uh, so I don't know what you can do with 50 bucks a month, but like I say, it's not much. But, you know, what if I want a private room or something? You know, 10 care doesn't only pay for semi-private room. What if I wanted to throw pony up another hundred bucks a month to pay for a private room? Well, I don't have it, right? Because I've spent everything down and all I get is a $50 personal needs allowance. What if I want a private sitter to sit with me, help me change a channel on the TV or may help me change, you know, uh, get to the toilet and back or help me with audio books and stuff like that. So we, so we want to retain some money that's above and beyond the personal needs allowance so that we can get a better level of care. I mean, the purpose is when you know, a family member needs long-term care, they're able to get it without being wiped out financially. Okay. That's pretty much the purpose. So when we deal with long-term care planning, uh, some folks struggle with the ethics. I mean, this sounds too good to be true. Is this legal? Well, of course it's legal. I mean, it's all done pursuant to, uh, to their rules. And I get this a lot, you know, people just get amazed at what we can do. And they say, is this legal? <laughs> I have to chuckle a little bit because you know, I certainly wouldn't do anything illegal. I'm an officer of the court. And not only is it legal, I mean, it's not exactly my idea either. I mean, I'm the, I'm uh, just following the rules. Anyway, we were talking about crisis planning when you're in the nursing home. And a lot of folks come and they see me and I tell them what they can do. And it's like, you can really save like 70%, 80% of our assets, even though somebody's already in the nursing home. I mean, is that legal? (laughs) And, uh, you know, like I said, I, I laugh at that because, of, I mean, of course it's legal. I mean, this is not Stan Prochowski's rules on how to, you know, transfer assets or uh, plan for a uh, nursing home. Uh, this is all done pursuant to, you know, the Medicaid, the TenCare Act, the Deficit Reduction Act, you know, the uh, step also impoverishment rules. I mean, I, I, there's no creative thinking here on my part. Well, there's some about how I apply them, but I mean, the rules are there. It's not my rules that do it. It's their rules. So. I mean, to this day, I'm amazed at what we can do for people. I mean, the planning strategies that are available are just sheer genius. So, I mean, so many people don't take advantage of what's out there. A lot of people, uh, some of my colleagues even, uh, think of Medicaid as a program of last resort. I mean, they think it's a program that once your funds are completely dry uh, and you're completely impoverished, then there's the Medicaid uh, safety net, so to speak. Well, I mean, but think of it this way. If you're if you're completely impoverished, then you have to rely on a program to take care of everything that doesn't pay for everything. Okay. I mean, the program doesn't pay for everything, but you don't have anything left uh, and you want it to pay for everything. So, and you know, some people in the government don't want you to be able to do this. I mean, some, some want to keep the purse strings pretty tight, uh, but others in government do. I mean, they pass laws that allow it, but uh, all the strategies that I use are, are well-founded in statute. So, um, let me give you an example. Uh, back in 2005, Congress enacted the Deficit Reduction Act. Uh, of course, you know, trying to find money to help reduce the debt, right? So the DRA is what we call it. The, the DRA amended Section 1917 sub C of the Social Security Act. And Tennessee adopted the DRA in 2006. Well, part of the DRA changed the look-back period. Remember me talking about that? Well, it was three years. Um, and the DRA now changed it to five years. 49 states adopted the five-year look-back period. So they, you know, they change it, you know, because that's more money they can get at to help the deficit reduction, I guess is the logic. So, uh, you know, if they change it once, I mean, they can change it again. So I think that's particularly overdue. So the sooner the better on that five-year rule. Okay, back to crisis planning strategies. Now, what if we, what if we could save most, maybe even all of your wealth if somebody went in the home? I mean, does that sound interesting to you? Of course it does. I mean, who wouldn't want that? Okay, one thing we can do that's uh, you don't hear people talk about. I mean, if you're a husband and wife, now we're talking about a married couple. If you're a husband and wife and one of you has to be institutionalized and go into a, a nursing home, 
we can exercise the spousal transfer. This is a pretty neat tool. Uh, you can transfer nearly an unlimited amount of assets from the institutionalized spouse to the healthy spouse, or sometimes called the community spouse. Um, now, this is an allowed transfer, meaning it's allowed without being subject to the penalty period. So we can go ahead and transfer assets from one spouse to the other. Sounds like a gift, right? Well, maybe it is, but it's an allowable transfer and they don't punish us for it. They don't, it's not subject to that, that look back rule and that equation we talked about. And you don't get the penalty period because you've gifted assets away. So think about this. You can transfer out of, you know, let's say I'm the one going in the nursing home. My wife is the, the, the healthy spouse at home. Uh, I can transfer out of my name, uh, the house that I live in, my home. I can transfer out my savings account. I can transfer out my brokerage account, my, you know, my investment account, my Charles Schwab or my Raymond James account. I can transfer all that to my wife, un almost unlimited. When I do that, what am I doing? Well, I'm accelerating my eligibility because I'm transferring all you know, the excess assets that I have that are disqualifying me for benefits. Uh, benefits. So I can do all that without spending it down. I mean, I'm keeping every bit of within the family by transferring to the spouse. I'm not spending it all in long-term care, or the cost of care, until I don't have any more and then qualify. I'm giving it to the spouse. So um, now that, that's important. That's important, isn't it? I mean, it's worth knowing that you can do that. And you probably don't hear that being talked about by the nursing home or uh, out at the hair salon or from your next door neighbor. But it's an important strategy. And look, think, just think about it. Just think what you can do. Now, here's the trick. Now, once we do an unlimited spousal transfer, then we get me qualified for benefits, right? Now, now my spouse can give away as much as she wants if she if, is, and it doesn't affect me, not one bit. Now, remember, before I qualified, anything I gave away or my spouse gave away or that we gave away together would have triggered a penalty period of ineligibility, right? Because we gave away assets for less than fair market value. But once I'm qualified to receive the benefits, well, then my spouse can give away as much as she wants, and it doesn't affect my eligibility one iota. Now, that's pretty darn good to know, isn't it? I mean, suppose the wife and I have this piece of property, and we wanted to give it to our son so he could build on it, okay? Well, we can't, we can't give it to him now because I'm in crisis, right? I'm in the nursing home. So we give it to him. You know, they're going to say, okay, you, you don't get, you, know, you get a penalty period. So, I'm in the nursing home. And if we give it away again, you know, we get this penalty period, um, you know, the, and to review a penalty period is when 10 care won't pay for my care because I gave something away. But what I can do is I transfer my ownership to her under the spousal transfer. Then after I'm qualified, she can give it to her son. Then it won't impact me a bit. Not at all. Now it will impact her. Why? Because it's a gift or it's a transfer that's subject to the penalty period. But look what we can do. Here's what we can do. After the institutionalized spouse is qualified, now we can set up an interest, an income only asset protection trust, have the spouse transfer most of that property to the trust. Now, if she can stay healthy for a while, we would have protected all of it. Now, I think you can see how powerful that strategy is. I mean, I use it a lot. So um, anyway, so since we can't use the uh, income only asset protection trust in crisis, how about a different kind of irrevocable trust? How about what's called a first party pooled special needs trust? Now this is this is sort of like a common trust that's you know run by run by and administered by a professional trustee. People put their money into this trust and it's it's not a penalized transfer. Why? Well, because it's a sub account in a large pooled account that they'll use the money to pay for the participants care. You know, it's one of these ones where, you know, you and other people, strangers to you, you know, it, it, just other folks put your money into this pooled account and they use that for the cost of care. Some put in more and, and less than others. Some require more care or less care than others, but that's how it's administered. Once you put the money into the pool trust, it is not, quote, a transfer. Now, so now you put your money in the trust, you've gotten rid of your excess assets, you qualify for 10 care, they pay 10 pay. They pay the cost of care, meaning 10 care. 10 care is now going to pay the cost of care. And if you need anything else that 10 care doesn't pay for, which is quite a bit, the pooled trust can use it for your benefit. They use your money to buy things for your benefit. See how that works? Pretty amazing, huh? Okay, how about this? If we're going to be punished 
with a penalty period for things we give away for less than market value. Maybe we can structure a gift that is for, for fair market value. Well, we can. Let's see how that looks. There's a thing that's called the family caregiver, caregiver agreement. Now, the details of the family caregiver agreement is a topic that I'm going to have to save for a future radio show because they're, they're, it can be quite involved. But essentially, here's what we do. We can compensate somebody in the family for helping to take care of us. I mean, there's probably a lot of people out there. I'm willing to bet there's a ton of people out there that are really being caregivers right now. I mean, for no compensation and for whatever reason, maybe they don't feel comfortable, but maybe they can't afford it. But uh, basically, it's a labor of love. And I stress the word labor because it is, in fact, that. Well, just go, let's let yourself be compensated, because if you do let yourself be compensated, it is a big help. It is a tremendous benefit to the person that's in crisis. We can enter an agreement where we can pay a lump sum to a family caregiver for a certain amount of care for the rest of our expected life. Now, it is an agreement, so you have to provide the services that you say you're going to provide. But basically, if you agree to render a level of care to a family member that's in need of, in need of care, and let's, let's use an example. Let's say this person has a life expectancy of 10 years. We go to the Social Security actuarial, actuarial tables, and it's you've got 10 years of life expectancy. And let's say that, you know, the care you're going to do, you're going to give about 20 hours a week. I agree. You know, I'm going to take, you know, you're in a nursing home, but I'm going to carry to Walmart every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday for an hour or two. And I'm going to come by and we're going to read books. And anyway, we're going to do 20 hours a week. That's a reasonable number of hours, right? And, you know, let's say we're going to do it for a reasonable fee of $20 an hour. That's, you know, reasonable is where you are, but, um, you know, around here, $20 an hour is considered, you know, considered reasonable. So, Here's what we can do. We can pay that person. If you do the math on that, 10 years, 20 hours a week, 20 bucks an hour. That works out to a little over $200,000. So here's what we can do. We can pay that person, the family caregiver, $200,000 all at once right now. Big old lump sum. That moves a lot of wealth out of the estate without being subject to the penalty period. Why? Because we used it on services for fair market value. I mean, we didn't give it away. We gave it away in exchange for uh, the services in the agreement. But really, you know, really, we kind of are giving it away because we keep it in the family and it's, it's managed, you know, to ensure we'll have a good quality of life. So, you know, that, we'll talk about that in a future show because that's a really nifty tool if, you know, if someone's willing to do that. So, uh, you know, if you're set up with in the family, if somebody's in a position to help care for you, you know, this is something that uh, you need to take note of. So another great strategy that I use a lot is called the Medicaid compliant annuity. Suppose, let's look at this scenario. Suppose you're in long-term care and you have to qualify so that, you know, tech care will pay for the nursing home bill, right? <clears throat> the problem is you have $150,000 of excess assets. You got too much stuff. Um, so you don't qualify. <clears throat> well, instead of spending that resource down and spend the spending it and then not having any of it when you're done, because you would have spent it all for your care because you're already in the nursing home. So instead of spending that down, what if we could turn that resource that's disqualifying us and turn it into a stream of income? How could that help? All right. What we can do is we can take that $150,000 and we can gift away 60 or 70% of that money to our kids. Okay. Gift it away. I mean, outright gift, just give it away to them. Well, we know that's going to trigger a penalty period, right? Because we talked about that. We do. I mean, we just gave away about one hundred five thousand dollars. I mean, Ten Care is going to uh, want to punish us for giving that away, and they will with the penalty period. But we know that, right? I mean, this is no surprise to us. I mean, we just did it intentionally. I mean, that's why we only gave away about seventy percent of the assets. That's why we didn't give it all away because what we're going to do is we're going to purchase a Medicaid compliant annuity that is exactly calculated to pay us an income that will pay the nursing home for exactly the length of time of the penalty period. So we give the money to the kids. Then we use the bounce to purchase uh, the Medicaid compliant annuity. Now we're qualified. So we apply for 10 care. 10 care says, okay, that's great. Uh, you qualify. I mean, you're otherwise qualified to receive the cost of care and benefits, except we have to first punish you for giving that money to your kids. And so a penalty period is going to apply. So 10 care is ready to pay and they will pay, but not until after the penalty period has run. Okay. 
Now, since the Medicaid compliant annuity is exactly calculated to pay us through the penalty period, we're going to immediately start getting a monthly annuity payment that is equal to our private pay cost of care. Now, since it's calculated to pay the cost of care, at the same time the penalty period expires, so does the Medicaid compliant annuity. So at that point, you're already qualified or you're already otherwise eligible. And, you know, and, but not after the penalty period. But when the penalty period expires, 10 year begins to pay for your care. So, uh, what was the economic result of that? Well, out of $150,000, we managed to transfer $110,000 or somewhere around there to our children, and it's gone. They, they can't get after it. I mean, 10 cares now paying the bills, and our kids can use that money, you know, to pitch in and pay for us to have, a, you know, that private room or private sitter like we talked about, stuff like that. So, all right. Hey, listen, I'm, I said I would take calls as they come in. Let me just mark my spot. Um, looks like we got a call on the line. Uh, looks like Chuck from Huntsville, Alabama. Chuck, you're on uh, a state, a bulletproof estate planning. Good evening, Mr. Stan. Hello, I've been Mr. listening Chuck. to you for about three weeks now, and you've touched a very sensitive topic that my wife and I have been finding ourselves in. Neither one of us have a will, or we don't have a will or trust. I'm 72 years old and in very good health, at least to date. Uh, my wife is much younger than I am, and we have just sold off some assets, and we're finding ourselves holding a very large sum of cash. How can I use the income-only asset to work in my favor? Okay, good question. And How can I? You know, it sounds like uh, your your circumstances are perfectly situated for the income-only asset protection trust. And so here's because you are healthy. I mean, you're 72, but if you're in good shape, um, you know, if you've been listening for a couple of weeks, you know that if you we create this trust, uh, we would transfer a majority of those assets. Now, we want to keep out of it um, what you need to live off of. But if you've just sold some property and you just have the the purchase price, you know, so you got, you know, a couple hundred thousand dollars for a piece of property, um, we can move that money, that account into the trust. Now, when we do that, if you can stay out of the nursing home, and if your wife is much younger than you, she has even a better chance of staying out of the nursing home. If you can stay out of the nursing home for five years, and you said you were in good health. So if you can stay out of there for five years, I mean, that would be the ultimate goal. Because once you attain that five years, then you, there's two things. One, they can never use the amount in that trust to calculate a penalty period for you. And, you know, so you'll escape the five-year look-back period. And because of the terms and conditions of an asset protection trust, there never will be any estate recovery or, I mean, if they, anybody, if they try to recover from your estate, they can't reach any of the assets in that trust because it is a creditor protection trust. So they will be barred just like any other creditor from ever getting anything in there. So those, those assets will be available for you. If you do go into the nursing home to help enhance your quality of life, or if you never do, they'll be protected so that you can in, have an inheritance that you give to your children. But if you do go into the nursing home, 10 care is going to pick up the tab and pay for everything. They, your family can, I mean, your trust can use that money to augment your quality of life. And, you know, that'll, that'll go a long way because 10 care is paying 95% of the bill. Um, so anyway, uh, that's a perfect well, solution for somebody like you. Um, well, if, if I have that money in a trust, would I be able to make an income off of it? Well, I mean, would I be able to, would that money be able to make, make an income for me? Thus, the name Income Only Asset Protection Trust, meaning any income it generates comes to you. The, the principal needs to stay in the trust. We talked about that, and we don't want to, we can't realize the principal and go, you know, spend it. But if it generates, if you put it in an Edward Jones account or some kind of managed account or gold bars or something, and it generates an income, you can, you can take that all day long and use it as your, your living expenses. You can do whatever you want with it, as long as the so assets. We could take that, we could take that income off and use that as our month-to-month living expenses, then. Is that correct? Absolutely. That's entirely what we use it for. Great. Some folks put their house in there, which may not generate any income, but, you know, you could put a rental house in, and that would, or, or like you're talking about, assets in a uh, some sort of managed account. That you know Anything it generates, you get to keep as income. Okay. Is there a limit on how much cash you can put into a uh, nope. income only? <laughs> no, no limit. No limit. I've seen... 
A couple Very million. Good. You say you have a, a seminar in Pulaski soon? I do. It's Saturday the 19th at 10 a.m. Some folks one of the Saturday ones, so that's what we'll do. Oh, we're here at the Star Theater on uh, the Square in Pulaski. And how do okay, I so make arrangements for that? Call my office, 931-363-7222. Talk to one of the girls. Tell them you want to be on the RSVP list, and they will put you down, and we'll save a spot for you. Well, thank you very help? much. I really enjoy it. Oh, you're welcome. Thank you. Right, okay. Great call. Great question. Um, okay, so we're talking about the um, – Medicaid compliant annuity and how we uh, can save, you know, maybe 70% of the assets. So uh, let me ask you, let me ask you a question when we talk about this Medicaid compliant annuity, what sounds better to you? Spend the whole $150,000 down on a nursing home cost of care. Um, you know, then when it's gone, you have to depend on 10 care for all your care. But remember, they don't pay for all your care okay? or purchase a Medicaid compliant annuity and once 10 care pays for the nursing home and the cost of care, you know, then your kids have over a hundred thousand dollars to spend on enhancing your quality of life above and beyond what 10 care will pay for. Anyway, I think the, the, uh, the latter is obviously the better choice. So uh, what about jointly held real estate? Um, let's see if I can get through this before the break or if another caller calls it. Uh, suppose my son owns a home and it's worth $200,000 and I give him a hundred thousand dollars. That's a gift, right? Well, and I'll be penalized for that gift, but suppose we get something for it. So it's not a gift. What if we give my son a hundred thousand dollars in exchange for him putting my name on the deed? Okay. Now I got fair market value. So there's no penalty, right? I didn't gift it away. I got something for it. Matter of fact, I gave him a hundred thousand dollars. I got a hundred thousand dollar interest in his home. I now own an interest in his home as joint tenant with right of survivorship. Now, we transfer the money. It isn't a gift. The big question now is, is it an asset? I mean, sure, looks like one, doesn't it? Looks like one to me. Well, it is a countable asset that will make us ineligible for 10 care. Or will it? <laughs> okay, this is the rest of the story, right? I mean, let's think about it. If my son lives in the home and he and I are joint owners, the only way 10 care can get at the asset is to have me sell it. Suppose my son refuses to sell. I mean, after all, he lives there. He lives there with his family. So this is an asset, but since it's jointly owned and one owner refuses to sell, it has become an unavailable asset. You know, therefore, you, you now call I can now qualify for 10 care and it's won't, you know, this unavailable asset will not be used against me. I mean, it's kind of like a timeshare. I mean, it's an asset, but you, you can't really even give it away. I mean, you just cannot get at it. Now, if you can't get at it, it's an, it's unavailable. And then 10 care will not use it as a countable asset. So, and if, the good news is if it's the right of survivorship, like we said, that means that all ownership instantly vests with the survivor at the moment of death. So it's not subject to the state recovery rule because it belongs to my son at my death, not my estate. So, you know, jointly held uh, real estate is a pretty nifty way uh, uh, to um, shelter some money and some assets where you don't get penalized. OK, uh, I have some questions that got emailed in. Some folks are just too shy to call in, I suppose. And uh, they email me after the show. And there were some good ones. Um, so I'm going to go over those. Uh, here's a question I got. that said, if you uh, this is a question I knew I would cover today in this topic. So I saved this one for first. And that is. Question is, if you give your property away to your kids, can they come and take it from them? Okay, now, I assume they mean them, meaning TenCare or Medicaid. So uh, uh, the answer is no. I mean, here, let's take a house, a deeded piece of property. If you deed it to your kids now, ownership is complete. I mean, uh, you have passed ownership from you to them. Uh, so, you know, the, the TenCare lacks the jurisdiction to go to your kids and take the property and say, we're taking it back. You know, that that doesn't happen. But what remember what we talked about, what they do is they punish you by imposing this penalty period that you have to private pay and say they say, well, we're not going to pay you for this number of months based on the value of the asset that you gifted away. And uh, so they can't take it from your kids, but they can punish you for doing it. Now, 
So another thing along that note, this really wasn't part of the question, but uh, I'm going to add to it. And that is, if you do give something away, like especially if you give it to our income only asset protection trust. Um, in Tennessee, Tennessee is one of the few states that lets you cure an asset transfer or cure a penalty period. So let's say you give something away like the home and, you know, as luck has it, you know, a year later, you need care. And it's like, okay, I, I need to get the house back. Well, you can, you can cure the gift. You can give the house back to you from that trust. Or uh, if you give it to the kids, hopefully they'll give it back to you. But if you can cure it, then you can make the penalty period go away. And you can do a partial cure. Like if you gave away some money and you can only get half of it back. I mean, you can cure it to the extent that you can get the, get money back. So, okay. I hope that answers that question. Um, what if they change the five-year look back? How does that affect plans that are already in place? Get, I get this question all the time. It's a good question. They changed it once. It was three years. They changed it to five. They could change it to something else. A lot of people come in and tell me they think it's already at seven. Well, it's not. It's still at five. But if they do, uh, no problem. It still is going to be whatever it is when you entered your plan. And we can even see that coming because, you know, Medicaid can change it whenever they want. But Tennessee, if they adopt the change, let's just say they change it to seven years. And Tennessee says, okay, we're going to adopt that. Congress, the legislature adopts it. They send it off to the governor. He signs it. Tennessee's law is only going to effect two times a year, January 1st and July 1st. So if that happened tomorrow, I mean, we'd see it coming. It would not be law here until July the 1st. So uh, anyway, um, yeah, you know, if, if it changes, I guess a non-legal term is your grandfathered in, so to speak. Okay. All right. Uh, let's see. My, my husband is already in the nursing home and receiving benefits. He has recently inherited some money uh, from a sibling. Okay. This happens from time to time. You got somebody that's in the, you know, in care, they qualify for benefits and you know, they're paying benefits. Now all of a sudden um, may they sell something or like in this case, they inherit money. Now, now they suddenly have excess assets. Let's just say they inherit ten thousand dollars from you know their sister. Now they got ten thousand dollars of excess assets. That's going to disqualify them. So if that happens, what you do is you have that calendar month to do something with that. So if it happens on the first, you got a month to deal with it. If it happens on the 29th, you're going to have to hustle. Um, you know, I think that rule kind of sucks, but that's that's the way it is because it seems like it always happens late in the month. But so you know you inherit the ten thousand dollars. What do we do? Well, we can use some of these these crisis strategies to get rid of it, like that Medicaid compliant annuity. I mean, that's a perfect, you know, buy an interest in the in somebody's home. All those things we talked about, but we have you know that time to deal with it. So, um, good. That's a good question. Good question. Um, all right. You uh, you mentioned that you intentionally trigger a penalty period. Why would you ever want to do that? <laughs> okay. I like that. I like that question. That does sound kind of, kind of um, arrogant, I guess. Or something. There's this penalty period. And occasionally in our planning, part of the planning is we actually trigger it or get it started. Now there's two times that I can think of that, that that can happen. One is with our income only asset protection trust. We transfer property to a trust and boom, the five-year clock starts. It's not really a look back period, but I call it a five-year look forward period. Now, why would we want to do that? Well, we want to, here's why. Because when you, the five-year look-back period doesn't come into play until you're actually institutionalized and you file the 10-care application. The day you file the application, the five-year look-back period begins. Well, if we do it now, we're going to tr start the clock now while we're healthy, not when we're in the home and we're already sick and we, we trigger it then. Now there's nothing we can do about it. We're going to trigger it now and take advantage of that. And every year we're into that, we're going to think, okay, how do we look for qualification now? And how do we look for qualification now? So uh, the other time is with that Medicaid compliant annuity I just told you about. If we're going to give away 70% of an asset, that's going to trigger a penalty, right? Because we gave it away. But we intentionally do that because now we're going to use the balance of the annuity to pay through that penalty period. And when that's when that penalty period is finished, we instantly qualify. I mean, we instant, they'll start paying because we already qualified. And so uh, we're good to go. Tim Care is going to pay. And we've transferred 70% of the asset outside the family. We didn't spend it down and use it all and now have nothing left to deal with. Let's see. Uh, uh, Ms. Vivian from uh, up in Spring Hill. Uh, 
I want to create a trust for myself, for me and my husband, but he has dementia and everything we own is joint. Okay. That's pretty typical. Um, does he still have to sign? How is this handled legally when he's so confused about what's going on? Okay. I get you. Uh, one spouse has got onset of dementia, has a little trouble dealing with stuff. Well, if he's too confused, I mean, you can still do all of this. You can do every bit of it, but you know, how's he going to do it if he's not competent to sign? Well, hopefully before he was incompetent, you managed to get a power of attorney and hopefully the power of attorney allowed you to do trust for him. Now, if, if he didn't give you the power of attorney and has now lost the ability to give it to you, you're kind of stuck with a conservatorship, which is a court appointed power of attorney. And that's a legal process. It gets very expensive and it can take three or four months. I mean, we're always doing one or so in the office here for people who don't get around to doing power of attorney. But uh, if you haven't and his dementia is still not too bad or it's not 24 seven, get a lucid moment and have him sign over power of attorney to you. Now he doesn't have to sign. You can do it for him as his agent. So that's a good question, Ms. Vivian. Uh, very good. Uh, let's see. We got a special needs adult. This is a Annabelle from Leoma down. There. That's a little south of Lawrenceburg down here. We have a special needs child and we're familiar with the income threshold. He has to stay under in order to continue receiving the government assistance. That's right. That's correct. How can we leave our home and assets to our son without disqualifying him from these services? Another very good question. Uh, I'm running low on time, but I'll try and be quick. When you have a special needs child, they can't own too much property. It's like $2,000. If they do, they disqualify for government benefits. So we want to preserve that. So what we do is we create a special needs trust, put somebody other than the special needs child as trustee over the trust, and we put anything we want to put into that trust for their benefit. So at death, we can fund that special needs trust with uh, the house and bank accounts. We can have a million dollars in a special needs trust that's used to enhance the quality of life for that special needs person. It can pay the rent. It can buy them a house. If they drive, it can pay for their car. I mean, it can do whatever it wants to do because it's not the, sp the special needs person doesn't own it. They're not the trustee. It's in trust for their benefit. That's a big difference, okay? So that's how we preserve that. If what you heard this week has piqued your interest, I'm glad. My mission is to get the message out that when it comes to estate planning, you have options, lots of options. If you have any questions about your own circumstances, I'm more than happy to take the time to answer. You can call my office at 931-363-7222 or send me an email at stan at prochowskiestatelaw.com. That's stan, S-T-A-N, at P-I-E-R-C-H-O-S-K-I estatelaw.com Visit my website and check out where I'll be giving my next free educational seminar. My website is www.pierchowskiestatelaw.com Thank you for listening to Bulletproof Estate Planning and I am Estate Plan Stan.